Hey, welcome back to the End of History podcast. Today, we're posting part three in our History of the Christian Right podcast series. This one's entitled Christian America Undone, the Turbulent 60s and 70s. This is a big one and covers a lot of the, the social transformations that the U.S. underwent during that time period. These were changes that changed most of us or changed the way most of us see the world today. I mean, and I mean that really literally. A lot of the assumptions that we have regarding society, regarding culture, those assumptions today, they were actually established as recently as the 1960s and 70s in America. And that doesn't mean they were right, necessarily. As always, if you enjoy this podcast series, please consider sharing it on your social media, on those social media feeds like Facebook, Twitter, wherever. I guess it's X now. We'd love to hear your feedback. Watch for episode four to drop later this week. Thanks for listening, everyone. This is the end of history. A true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. We believe that peace is at hand. An axis of evil arming to threaten the peace of the world. Welcome back to the end of history. And this is part three. This episode, this podcast episode is part three in an ongoing series we're doing on the history of the religious right in America. If you haven't listened to the first two episodes yet, I would advise you listen to those first. Uh, Listen to them in order just to keep up with the story that we're telling here. Um, This one is going to be a fun one because in this one, we're actually going to see some developments that start to give shape to the modern religious right, you're going to start to recognize uh, some of some familiar things, uh, especially if you grew up in the relig- religious right or in Christian circles, churches, things like that during the 80s and 90s. We're not going to get all the way to the 80s yet, but in this episode, we'll be addressing some issues, and you'll see, oh, that's where that came from, or that's where that started. So this will be a fun one today. Now, one of the uh, one of the things we see is we as we look at the history of the religious right in America after World War II, and it should be obvious over the course of this series, is how there are significant swings of the pendulum from both sides. Okay, so one decade might feature a major thrust in in advance of the agenda of the Christian right, while the next decade or generation features a thrust in advance from the other side and a decline of the Christian right's agenda and policies. So, For example, some people might believe that right now we're in the middle of a decade of the decline of the Christian right, if not the destruction of the Christian right. I guess, you know, the future will tell a story, but the rise of LGBT, uh, well, first of all, President George W. Bush was kind of the, the zenith of the Christian right in American politics. And since then, we've seen a massive backlash to that. Well, if history's any judge, and uh, of things, what we'll probably experience over the course of the next decade is a backlash against those liberal policies and the the things that work to launch out against the Christian right in the first decade of this new century. So keep that in mind as we go along. Well, like we saw in the last decade, or I'm sorry, in the last episode, the 50s and the presidency of Dwight D. Eisenhower, that was a time of really huge advance for the Christian right. Now, they weren't called the Christian right at that point in history. That name and that label was really still a long way off in the future. But in the 50s, the ideas of a God bless America really came alive in popular culture and in the political landscape. As as anti-communism sentiments swelled in the post-war years, there was this certain fear and paranoia in America. McCarthyism and the Senate hearings on un-American activities, they captured a lot of that. You know, Senator Joe McCarthy, he used anti-communist platforms to launch a sort of witch hunt on the American entertainment industry, on the American political system, and even within the American Defense Department. And so he and many like him were convinced that communists had infiltrated the American system and they began trying people during the 50s. In America, patriotic enthusiasm for the democratic way of life reveals itself in a monster loyalty parade in New York. Everyone from vets to youngsters reveals his inborn dislike of communism. Today the most dangerous enemy agent 
is not so much concerned with the secret information about weapons as he is with infiltrating the necessary departments of the government and shaping and controlling the actions of our nation so that the enemy is progressively winning, winning without even firing a single shot. Now I intend to name names, John S. Service. And remember that name if you will. I have never knowingly transmitted any information which was, shall we say, secret military plan. One communist on the faculty of one university is one communist too many. One communist among the Amer American advisors at Yalta was one communist too many. And even, even if there were only one communist in the State Department, even if there were only one communist in the State Department, that would still be one communist too many. Modern movies and stories have really captured this time period well to demonstrate how lives and careers were virtually ruined during the McCarthy era. If, you, if you've seen the newer movie uh, Trumbo, or uh, Good Night and Good Luck, and there's an older one that's, that always stuck out to me, uh, Robert De Niro movie, Guilty by, Guilty by Suspicion. If you've seen any of those, then you're familiar with what I'm talking about as far as the McCarthy era. It was kind of an easy task. Remember, during the as from the George uh, Joe McCarthy perspective, it was kind of an easy task. If you remember, during the Great Depression, a lot of the people were open to ideas of communism, at least partially open. They were more open than they had been in the past, at least. Okay, so a lot of those people who were college students in the 1930s were now leaders in the American political, American military, academic, and entertainment systems by the time the 1950s roll around. So when Senator McCarthy said people in these influential American positions had ties and sympathies to communism, you could easily locate where they had gone to meetings or been a part of organizations in the 1930s. All the proof was there. When the American public heard this stuff, they couldn't denounce McCarthy as some kind of raving lunatic. He had proof. You know, he had their, their names on, on membership roles or meeting attendance. So when they began to wonder if communism really had infiltrated America, was this stuff everywhere? Well, there was the evidence. The space race began in the 50s, and the Russians, they're the first to, to enter space with Sputnik. The Russians had nuclear weapons by the early 50s. China fell to the communists in 1948. There was this sense that World War III could happen any time now, and communists were after global domination and to destroy the American way of life. So fear mongers pushed this thought as well. So there was, it was a pervading sense throughout the country during that time period. So how do you get rid of the threat and the fear of communism? You rely on Americanism. America was the land of the free, the, the home of the brave. It was the opposite of the communists. They were the slaves, we were the free. We, they were dark, we were light, they were the atheists. And of course, we were a nation born of God. So that idea spread like wildfire in the 1950s, and it gave people hope. It gave people comfort. This was the reason that people like President Dwight Eisenhower were so happy to push it when he was president. People who supported America were people who supported a religious America. American values, they, they supported religious American values, right? Those were all one and the same. God bless America in the 1950s. So the line was set. There were the communists or communist sympathizers, and then there were the Americans, the one who saw the plan, the will of God on the rise of America, or in the rise of America after World War II. An ideology had been born, and it was spread rapidly into every corner of America during the decade of the 50s. When I was a kid, I watched this Charlton Heston movie, The Ten Commandments on TV. Now, this was 30 or 40 years after the movie was released in 1956. It stood the test of time as far as I was concerned, and it still does. The pinnacle of the movie is always, I think for most people, it's the Red Sea crossing. The special effects may be old school, but they still work today. And even remakes of that movie, you know, remakes of the Exodus story, since that time, they may have better CGI special effects, but in my opinion, they pale in comparison to the original, the Charlton Heston version. But if you watch that movie lately, I'm, if you watch it as an adult, you realize the movie is about a lot more 
than the Ten Commandments and the Exodus and the Red Sea crossing, the maker of the movie set out to establish a reality in American life. Cecil B. DeMille, he was telling a story not only of Exodus, but of, Amer of American freedom and how that was born of God. Now, maybe it wasn't on the TV version that I saw when I was a kid, but if you, if you buy this DVD today, it's still there. I've seen it. At the beginning of the movie, Cecil B. DeMille actually makes an address to the viewers, the audience who's watching this movie, and he tells what this movie and the Exodus story is really about. And I want to I want to play that here. This is what people going to the movies in 1956 and watching this film, what they saw. Ladies and gentlemen, young and old, this may seem an unusual procedure, speaking to you before the picture begins, but we have an unusual subject, the story of the birth of freedom, the story of Moses. As many of you know, the Holy Bible omits some 30 years of Moses' life. From the time he was a three-month-old baby and was found in the bulrushes by, by Bethia, the daughter of Pharaoh, and adopted into the court of Egypt until he learned that he was Hebrew and killed the Egyptian. To fill in those missing years, we turn to ancient historians such as Philo and Josephus. Philo wrote at the time that Jesus of Nazareth walked the earth, and Josephus wrote some 50 years later and watched the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. These historians had access to documents long since destroyed, or perhaps lost, like the Dead Sea Scrolls. The theme of this picture is whether men are to be ruled by God's law, or whether they are to be ruled by the whims of a dictator like Ramesses. Are men the property of the state, or are they free souls under God? This same battle continues throughout the world today. Our intention was not to create a story, but to be worthy of the divinely inspired story created 3,000 years ago. So it's hard to encapsulate our story in this podcast series and what, what it was like during this time period better than that right there. The message being sent throughout America was clear. America and American freedom, they're from God. We have to protect that in order to fight the godless communists who want to destroy America, who want to destroy freedom, who want to destroy God. It's the story of Moses and Exodus, really. But I guess from a Christian perspective, from someone who's read the Bible, you've got to ask, is the story of Moses and Exodus, are they really about freedom? Maybe. But you have to stretch it pretty far to say it was about American freedom. It worked, though. The message worked. And it's not necessarily a bad message. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm not saying that at all. Heck, I like it. I think we start treading on dangerous ground, though, when we start equating nationalism to God's will. But I think there's also a thing called civic responsibility, and it's good for people to have that. This stuff in the mid to late 50s wasn't dangerous. It was good. It was wholesome. This is the area or the era that a lot of people look back to today when they remember a better America. This is where American nostalgia is almost always centered at today, especially for modern religious and political conservatives, but even for, for non-religious people. You know, people look to the 50s as a golden, innocent, wholesome age. Of course, the problem was that America that was blessed by God, and also, it, but it also had a lot of holes under the surface in the 1950s. Jim Crow discrimination, lynchings, all kinds of horrible injustices were not uncommon throughout the American landscape at that time. It wasn't a perfect world at all. Still, it's easy to see how a Christian American at the end of the 50s would, would look out and be pretty content with what he sees. And God we trust is written on the money. Kids go to school and they say a pledge of allegiance that declare, declares that America is one nation under God. The president goes to church, takes an oath on a Bible, and promotes the unity of civic responsibility and patriotism to a faithful walk with God. Our movies are wholesome. And they even talk about God and freedom. What more could you ask for, right? But the pendulum swings. And as we get into the 60s, it's going to swing fast and it's going to swing hard. And in the 60s, as the pendulum swings, we will arrive at the end of a decade, at the end of that decade, and there's going to be a divide. 
There will be a divide in place between those who believe in a Christian or religious America and those who don't. Those who believe in a religious America will look back on the chaos of the 60s and see it as a result of our moving away from the standards of God that the 50s, that golden era, had established. Those who aren't religious will give other causes, but, but, but they will, you know, they're not going to be able to see, they're not going to be able to agree again, I guess, by the end of the 1960s. There's a line drawn now. The 60s are the beginning of this tearing apart of America on the religious and ideological grounds. It was the beginning of what's come to be called the culture wars. Now, it started in the early part of the 1960s with some direct assault on the gains that Christians and patriots had made in the 1950s. There was this kickback against a lot of the gains that God Bless America ideology had made during the 1950s. The first big step, the first big kickback was in the area or in the area of, uh, of school prayer. Now, in the mid-50s, as the linking of American patriotism to religion was advancing so fast across the landscape, many schools and, and school boards, they decided to institutionalize school prayers. They made it official and, and even formalized what time of the day the teachers would lead their students in prayer and what, what those prayers would look like. One of those schools was the state of New York, you know, the Board of Regents and all the public schools that it oversaw in 1955. Now, unsurprisingly at the time, the stated purpose of the decision to, to enforce and promote prayer in school was to combat juvenile delinquency and stop the, the spread of communism. Of course, you gotta have the kids praying so the communism can't infiltrate our schools. That was the idea at the time. The official school prayer that this uh, New York Board of Regents instituted in 1955, and every student had to perform along with the Pledge of Allegiance went like this. It said, Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence on Thee. Got to have the old King James English to make it really religious. We acknowledge our dependence on Thee, and we beg Thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. Right? Not, not a big deal there. I mean, there's no, no harm in that that I can see. Right? Like I said, this kind of stuff was all in place all over the country, and it stayed that way for almost a full decade. But by the early 60s, some of the problems were becoming apparent. One of those problems was noted by a Jewish father in New York who saw his son come home and he's praying with his hands clasped and his heads bowed. Now that wasn't the way that this father had been taught to pray, nor was it the way that he had wanted his Jewish son to be taught how to pray. And that's when he learned about the impact of these school prayers upon his own family traditions, upon his own family now, and his own religious beliefs. So this was the beginning of the court case that ended up going all the way to the Supreme Court and ended the state sponsorship of prayer in school. It became a, a lightning rod for Christian political activism in the 60s and really ever since all the way to today. To this day, you'll hear people arguing that we need to get prayer back in schools and they're referring to this decision from over 50 years ago in 1962. But that was just the beginning. In 63, 1963, the following year, another Supreme Court decision said it was against the law for schools to promote and enforce mandatory Bible reading among the students, the public schools, that is. Now, both prayer and Bible reading were outlawed from the public schools. In the span of two years, all of these huge achievements of religious-oriented politics had been lost, had been wiped away. In the court case that outlaw school-sponsored Bible reading in the public schools, the original complaint was actually filed by a parent, another parent, who was a Unitarian. But in the pathway to the Supreme Court, there was a more famous defendant who actually jumped on board the court case. Her name's Madeline Murray O'Hare, and she would become a famous opponent of the religious right in future decades. O'Hare was an atheist. She founded the American Atheist Organization as part of her case against public school Bible reading. She also launched a magazine entitled American Atheist. O'Hare represented the, the deliberate attack and effort against those who saw the linking of patriotism and religion. She was more an activist, really, and an instigator than what she represented in other court cases, and deliberately, if not delightfully, set herself up as the, the villain in this story against those who saw America as a Christian or religious nation. Time Magazine once listed her as the most hated woman in America. This was during the 1960s for her anti-Christian and anti-religious efforts. Now, I've always kind of thought that was 
funny. I mean, Christians aren't supposed to hate people. So if this person really is the most hated person in America, and it's presumably because, are presumably Christians who hate her, then maybe there's a problem right there. Well, she became so notorious among those who would one day call themselves the religious right that many today mistaking, mistakenly believe that she was actually responsible for getting both prayer and Bible reading out of the schools. Now, she was outspoken and taunting in her op opposition to religion and religious leaders. Her, her brashness was really tailor-made for the beginning of the media age that the 60s would be part of launching. And for the next three decades, patriotic Christians would see her as the face of all that was wrong with a liberal America that was destroying the land born of God. This is Madeleine Murray O'Hare right here. It is a dehumanizing, sadistic religion that this Christianity is. It, ooh, it turns me cold. What do you have against God? Uh, first, Why does he bug you? Uh, well, first off, there isn't any. And second off, uh, the idea which you invented has caused more misery to every human Listen. being in all ages of history than any other single Listen, idea. Madeline. You're going to spend your whole life preparing to meet the Lord. Boy, you folks are crazy as hell. The Christians do is coercive. They ask for the strength of government behind them, and they ask for the strength of uh, tax funds behind them and special privileges behind them. Uh, we don't go into a courtroom and say you absolutely will say some sort of prayer to Madeline Murray before you testify, or that you will testify on the book that's written by Madeline Murray. We don't do that. You However, do that? you coerce the persons when they go in uh, with your domination of the culture to use your book as a criteria uh, to say a pledge of allegiance with your God underneath it. Yeah, I got it. Now, before we go into the history that continued to unfold in the 60s, we have to look at this, this issue of school prayer and Bible reading. That was the beginning of a huge spark that would explode into the cultural landscape in the next few decades. The first question to consider is what these Supreme Court decisions in 62 and 63 really mean. These Supreme Court decisions did not forbid students praying and reading the Bible in public schools. Contrary to what a lot of people are led to believe today. They outlawed the state or the school board making that prayer and Bible reading mandatory. Now, frankly, as a Christian, as a father myself, I don't have a really big problem with that. In fact, when you, when you look at the whole picture, I kind of prefer that. In the course of the political fallout from these decisions in the 60s, there were several attempts throughout the next couple of decades to get amendments added to the U.S. Constitution, Constitution to get prayer and Bible reading back in school. That, that was kind of like uh, the abortion issue in the 60s. Any politician who wanted to get the Christians behind them in their elections would say they were going to push for prayer and a prayer amendment to the Constitution so that prayer would be back in public schools. Most of them would actually do it too, or at least attempt to. Throughout the 60s, they were, or there were debates to Congress about one version of prayer amendment after another, and they always kind of came to nothing. But to do that, to have a law that says schools must have prayer and Bible reading in school really harkens back to the religious systems that America's founding fathers and settlers were escaping from Europe from. You know, they were, they were trying to get a, away from that reality, if you really think about it. I mean, who decides what kind of religion, what kind of prayers, what kind of holy books are read in school? Is it the president? Is it the Congress? Is it whoever's in power at the time? That was the stuff that led to religious wars in Europe, and it didn't go too well when they did that centuries ago. Of course, religious wars weren't the intent of these efforts toward constitutional amendments in the 60s and 70s. The sponsors of these bills always said that the local schools and their school boards and their, their local towns and constituents would determine what religion in the schools looked like. That was, that was usually the, the most popular way of handling that question. The important thing as far as the sponsors of these bills was concerned, the important thing was just to keep religion in the schools. That was the perspective of the sponsors of these different amendments throughout the decade. But that's a problem too when you really think about it. Today, Dearborn, Michigan, they have a huge Muslim population. So does that mean that the school theirs, if these amendments were passed, the schools theirs could enforce, or the schools in Dearborn, Michigan, they could enforce the reading of the Quran and prayers to Allah 
And what about the Christian students there? What about school districts where Catholics are the majority and Protestants the minority or vice versa? Would Protestant kids have to pray Catholic prayers and hear Catholic doctrine if they were the minority in that school district? These decisions in the Supreme Court at the beginning of the 60s were actually meant to protect the religious freedoms of minorities like the Jewish kid who was having to say Christian prayers or the Unitarian kid who was having to read the Christian Bible at school. The Supreme Court decisions, they weren't attacks on Christians or even religious liberty necessarily. They were simply saying to the advances of the 50s, hey, that's a little, that's a little too far. You've gone a little too far there. You can't force people to worship a God they don't believe in or worship in a way they don't want to. At least you can't do that as a public school with government funds because, you know, the government is funding those things. So it's indirectly, that means the government is pushing religion and and a perspective of religion on taxpayers, on citizens, on students. What happened, though, was there's this big backlash and overreaction to the Supreme Court decisions. In the 60s, the ideas of amendments that would bring prayer back to school helped kind of keep everyone focused to this idea or on the idea all the way up to today that people think this is what we actually need. We need a prayer amendment still on the Constitution. Ronald Reagan, President Ronald Reagan, he once said that as long as there were tests in school, there would still be students praying in schools. And he was right. And in fact, kids can still pray in school today. Those Supreme Court decisions didn't change that. The teachers just couldn't lead them in prayer and couldn't force them to pray. And at the end of the day, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. The real problem, and the part that plays more into our look at the rise of religious politics, goes deeper though. It wasn't an issue of prayer in school that was the the problem. The real issue was that religion had now become politicized. Just a bit in the 50s. And people began to mistake those politics for actual religion or religiosity. This right here, this is a clip from President Kennedy's remarks about the Supreme Court decisions at the time of his presidency. The first question at President Kennedy's news conference deals with the Supreme Court decision that a New York school prayer violates constitutional separation of church and state. The president's statement is in the nature of an effort to calm the storm over the decision. Well, I haven't seen the measures in the Congress, and you'd have to make a determination of what the language was and what the effect it would have on the First Amendment. The uh, Supreme Court uh, has made its judgment. A good many people, uh, obviously, will disagree with it. Others will agree with it. But I think that uh, it is uh, important for us, if we're going to maintain our constitutional principle, that we uh, support uh, Supreme Court decisions, even when we may not agree with them. In addition, we have, in this case, a very easy remedy and that is to pray ourselves. And I would think that uh, it would be a welcome reminder to every American family that uh, we can uh, pray a good deal more at home, we can attend our churches with a good deal more uh, fidelity, and uh, we can make uh, the true meaning of prayer much more important in the lives of all of our children. That power is very much open to us. And I would hope that uh, as a result of this decision that uh, all American parents uh, will intensify their efforts at home. Now, that makes a lot of sense, right? He's saying no one should stop praying. The president is saying that. We should all pray. Our personal spiritual walks should become stronger, in fact. But you have to remember also, this is a president who is having countless adulterous affairs at the time. He's a president who, around the same time period, was authorizing a coup that ended, ended in assassination of the leader of South Vietnam. Behind the scenes, in the privacy of his home and personal life, He wasn't religious or spiritual. There was no religious walk with God. He has a public political position about personal, private, religious life. Now That's quite a mouthful, but it has a lot of implications in the story of the development of the religious right and Christian politics. Now, I have a personal theory about the 1960s and all the social upheaval and tumult that occurred during this time period. This was a decade and generation defined by rebellion. And I've always kind of thought that the reason this generation of the 60s was so rebellious was because they were striking out against the hypocrisy of their parents' generation. This was a generation that said the right thing. The parents' generation was the one that said the right thing. But behind the scenes, there was a lot of the wrong things going on. 
That was true at the family level and it was true at the national level. We put in God and we trust on our money, pledged allegiance to one nation under God, but behind all of that we had a social system of apartheid and huge segments of the country where black people were held to subhuman status. Black people couldn't sit with white people or even in the same room at many restaurants. They couldn't even use the same bathroom or water fountain. The ideas of religion and freedom were fine, but what did they matter if they were only cover for a nation that allowed for oppression and injustice? And racism was just one of those issues. There were, there were others as well. In the 60s, more than anything else, during this time period, there was a pushing back against every social boundary and cultural norm of the American status quo. Religion was just one of those boundaries. So this was a decade that's synonymous with images of the civil rights movement, the anti-war protests, the sexual revolution, race rights. It's a decade when everything that was American got challenged and in a very large way, it came undone. When you get to the end of the 1960s, you have cities in New Jersey and California literally burning under race riots. You have the Democratic Convention where American police officers are beating student protesters on the nightly news. And the mayor of Chicago, Mayor Daley, he's actually flipping off the protesters from the platform of the Democratic Convention. You have anti-war protesters spitting on American soldiers and burning their draft cards. You've got people marching on Washington in protest. You've got Woodstock where they're celebrating sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And it's all very, very different from the beginning of the decade in the 1960s. And one side, by the end of this decade, one side is saying this is all happening because America's youth are sick of the hypocrisy of the American system and the way they, they want to be free from it. You have the other side, the people who believed America was birthed by God to be a religious nation, and they're saying, see, we told you so. You take prayer and the Bible out of school and look what happened to this country in less than a decade. The whole story has changed by this point in history. Religious Americans aren't just religious because they oppose communism anymore. That's the way it was in the 50s. They're religious because they want to go back to the America of the 50s before everything fell apart and before everything got really, really crazy in the streets and the homes of America. There's a book, I think, that's been turned into a movie. I think it's coming out this fall sometime. It's by Philip Roth, and it's called American Pastoral. I can't recommend the book. I mean, it's just a, a nightmare of depression, but it gives insight into the state of mind of those who went through the 50s, only to inherit the 60s. It's a novel, and it follows the main character, Seymour the Swede Lvov, or Lvov from uh, high school at the end of World War II, into the 50s, when he builds his life with his wife and his daughter. Then it all slowly just collapses into misery throughout the 60s. All the things that were predictable and stable, they fall apart. His daughter becomes an anti-war protester and, and eventually a terrorist. His, his business is burned in the riots. His wife leaves him. It's just one thing after another. And the story puts you in the place of this one person from a generation who was there when life was so good only to live and see it all fall apart and turn into something so bad. And by the end of the decade of the 60s, this was the experience of so many Americans. While the streets burned, with protests and the homes fell apart into new social freedoms, those who were holding on to some form of stability were reaching out for anything they could find to bring back that golden age they remembered from a decade before. And that was when the first attempt at organizing religion and politics really took shape. Remember the revivals of Billy Graham in the 50s? That I, I talked about that in the last episode in this series. Well, Billy Graham was still around and he was still doing all he could to kick against this upheaval with the message of God and the Bible. Graham had been a supporter of some of the religious leg legislation like the amendments to put prayer back in school, but nothing had really solidified. Nothing had really proved effective or come of that. So as the 60s neared their end, the tumult claimed even President Johnson, who had won a landslide, landslide victory in 1964. But the anti-war movement made it where he knew he would lose if he ran again in 68. So he announced he wasn't running. That's how fast the 60s turned American society inside out. Lyndon Johnson went from landslide winner to a guy who wouldn't even try for a second term. Well, Billy Graham and a lot of the religious leaders saw this, this as the moment they had to take advantage of. This was the moment where they could save America and get it back on the right track. Out of the ashes, they helped resurrect the political career, uh, political career of this man 
who you'll remember, Richard Nixon. Now, Mick Nixon had been the vice president under Eisenhower, but he had been sent into political oblivion not long after losing to John F. Kennedy in 1960 during the presidential election. In 68, Billy Graham never officially endorsed Nixon, but he gave him a whole lot of support in 1968. Now, today, Nixon is kind of the icon of American political corruption in this day and age, but that wasn't the case back then. In fact, if we put ourselves in the shoes of American Christians in 1968, the choice of Nixon, it kind of makes a lot of sense. He was, in a very real sense, he was a return to the 1950s. He had been the vice president under President Eisenhower during that decade when so many advances for Christian politics had taken place. He was staunchly anti-communist. One of the big claims, or one of his big claims to fame in the 50s was what was called the kitchen debates when he faced off with the Soviet premier Nikita Khrushchev. Hey, well, we wish you success. Is, uh, you could show us American possibilities and then we could say, here is what American possibilities are. How many years has America existed already? 300? 150 years of independence. Well then, we will say America has existed 150 years, and this is her level of achievement. We have existed not quite 42 years, and seven years from now, we will be on the same level of achievement as America. And the following years, we shall continue to surge ahead. And when we shall overtake you at the crossroads, we will greet you amiably. And after that, if you wish, we can stop and tell you, please follow us. And for people everywhere, there must be a free exchange of ideas. Uh, there are some instances where you may be ahead of us. For example, in the development of, your, of the thrust of your rockets for the investigation of outer space. There may be some instances, for example, color television, where we're ahead of you. But in order for both of us, for both of us, to benefit, no, no. in what are they ahead of us? Wrong, wrong. We are ahead of you in rockets as well as in this technique. I do not capitulate. Where do you see the picture? Это я вам фору вперед даю. You, you must not be afraid of ideas. What That's what we're telling you. Don't be afraid of ideas. We have nothing to fear. The time has passed when ideas scared us. We, do not, uh, we are not afraid of ideas. Yes. Well, then let's have more exchange yeah. of them. We all agree on that, right? Nixon, for a person living through the, the 60s uh, and, and longing to get back, I guess, to the 50s, the nifty 50s, was the, the closest thing you could get to getting in a time machine and taking America back to that time period. For Christians, 1968 was a turning point in the minds in the words of Billy Graham, if American Christian politics had been driven by a desire to oppose the atheism of communism in the 1940s and 50s, that was a far off secondary concern in 68. Now it was about survival. It was about the survival of America. It was about getting America back to a place of strength, back to a place of, of stability. The country had been there once and when, when it was there, it was when it was honoring God and its institutions and its laws. They had to get back to that Christian America place. Well, Nixon won the presidency in 68. His win wasn't accomplished really because of American Christians, but he spoke to a value system that American Christians gravitated to. It was traditionalism, what the, the hippies and the protesters called square and uncool, Nixon epitomized. But these things were traditional, safe. They were lauded in the eyes of American Christians. The two sides accidentally discovered one another, in a way, the Christians and Nixon. And unfortunately, that relationship didn't turn out too well. There's a book by the historian Stephen Ambrose, same guy who wrote uh, Band of Brothers and a lot of really good American history books. The one I'm thinking about here is called, I think it's called Comrades. And it looks at the history of friendships and relationships of great and influential Americans 
in history, just a small book. One, one chapter looks at George Armstrong Custer and his brothers. Another looks at Dwight Eisenhower and General Patton. The chapter on Nixon, it's entitled, Nary a Friend, all right? Nixon, for all his accomplishments, at his core, he's a politician. No one ever really got close to the man. And those who thought they did usually ended up finding out they were only being used by him. A lot of people were subdu seduced by the, by the power he wielded in his political career. And that, that led them to put their guard down and think they were actually relating with the man. They would later find out he was using them for his own benefit. And you can see this in folks like Henry Kissinger and a lot of others. You can also see this with the religious establishment that came to support Nixon as president after 1968. And it was kind of personified in the person of Billy Graham. So after becoming president, Nixon, the consummate politician, he realized the value that Billy Graham and the masses of American Christians that Graham represented could bring to a Nixon presidency. And he began consolidating this value into his presidency. Billy Graham became an unofficial advisor, and in the years that followed, he was a constant visitor to the White House, always having access to the ear of the president. For Graham and many American Christians, Nixon, he might have been square and uncool to the protesters, but he was willing to stand for what was right and get America back to the place where it was before. That's what the way they saw him. So Nixon, he put on a great appearance for the sake of religion. White House services were, were instituted, and every Sunday a new minister was invited to lead the service at the White House. Those speakers, of course, had to, put a, they had to pass a litmus test of patriotism and endorsement to the president and his values, but this was a minor, it's a subtle thing at that point. The White House, their, their church services, it kind of became a key event for those who were most loyal, most favored by the president. If you were in his good graces, you got an invite. If you were left off the list, you needed to be concerned. Richard Nixon was restoring the God bless to America and American politics. A lot of the times it was just an issue of patriotism. Nixon utilized Graham, Billy Graham, and a lot of the American Christian organizations to rekindle patriotism in America. If the hippies and the protesters could bring the nation down with their anti-American talk, then the Christians and patriots could counter them by bringing America up again into a place of pride and glory. On July 4th, 1970, there was this special Honor America Day that was broadcast on television from Washington, D.C. It was one of these huge rallies not far distance from what Billy Graham did in his big, you know, revival crusades. Well, in the background to the Honor America Day celebrations, Americans were just finding out that President Nixon, who had promised to end the war in Vietnam, had actually secretly authorized more bombings in another nation, in Cambodia. Then there were the shootings at Kent State University. The world was falling apart, and the Christians were trying to hold it all together. And this event at July 4th, on July 4th, 1970, organized by Billy Graham, was kind of a strain with all of our might event to hold America together as a Christian nation. And the event, it epitomized the two sides that were being established in American politics. On one side, at the same time as this, this big rally and, and event in Washington, D.C. is going on, on one side you've got protesters who filled the D.C. area surrounding the event. They're the long-haired hippies carrying the signs, echoing obscenities toward Nixon and the institutions of American government. On the other side, there's Billy Graham leading this special service to honor America. It was broadcast throughout the country. Entertainers from Bob Hope, Glenn Campbell, and Jack Benny, they're in attendance and they're performing at this event. Graham led the service. President Nixon did a recorded address to the, the service. Graham led the service, though, and a host of other Christian leaders from different denominations also played a part. This was the united America, the proud America, the God-fearing America. This was about getting America back to where America belonged before the 60s, back to where America was standing honorably before God. This is my country. This is our country. Here in Washington, on the steps of the memorial dedicated to one of our great fathers, we honor you, America, for you are our country. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2.17, Honor all men, fear God, honor the king, 
and the king referred to was the Roman emperor. Since our nation is a republic and not a monarchy, this scripture could read, honor the nation. Today, in the capital of the United States, thousands of us have come together to honor America on her 194th birthday. We stand here. We stand here today within the shadow of three great monuments. That great shaft over there honors George Washington, who led the revolution that obtained our freedom. Not far away is the memorial to Thomas Jefferson, father of the Declaration of Independence, which proclaimed the rights of free men and began the greatest experiment in freedom the world has ever known. Behind us is the memorial honoring Abraham Lincoln, who helped preserve the unity of this country by his courage, faith, and perseverance, and who gave black men hope that they too would become first-class citizens. We can listen. We can listen to no better voices than these men who gave us the dream that has become America. These men represent thousands who worked, prayed, and suffered and died to give us this nation. We're not only here today to honor America, but we're here as citizens to renew our dedication and allegiance to the principles and institutions that made her great. Lately, our institutions have been under attack. The Supreme Court, the Congress, the presidency, the flag, the home, the educational system, and even the church. But we're here to say with loud voices that in spite of their faults and failures, we believe in these institutions. 1970 was only the beginning though. As Nixon ramped up for his re-election in 1972, which he would end up handily winning with a landslide. Billy Graham and American Christians were strongly involved this time. Graham has always said he he doesn't endorse presidential candidates, but in 1970, he put on a ra- on a political rally. Well, it was a religious rally that was very close to being a political rally, and he came about as close to endorsing a president as you can come. At one of those big crusades that Billy Graham was famous for, for holding this one in 1970, he actually had President Nixon show up as the special guest of honor. And it's amazing video footage, if you've ever seen the video of this. No religious leader with as much influence as Billy Graham had ever been so public and blatant in their political endorsement. No president had ever tapped into the religious feelings of America like President Nixon was doing then. When Nixon walked onto the stage, the crowd kind of ignited at this, at this rally, the crowd kind of ignited in a mix of cheers and boos. The older Christians in the crowd were cheering. The younger Christians were booing and shaking their heads, holding up signs that read, Thou shalt not kill because of what was going on in Vietnam and Cambodia. to bring people together as we must bring them together if we're going to have peace in the world if our young people are going to have a fulfillment beyond simply those material things they must turn to those great spiritual sources that have made America the great country that it is I'm proud to be here and I'm very proud to have your warm reception thank you very much Sing together, God bless America, my home sweet home. God If you were to pick a moment in American history where the religious right was born, it would probably be right there. Never had there been so public public a convergence of Christian faith and American politics. And for the moment, Richard Nixon owned it. Now to be clear, this wasn't all happening 
with American Christians in the dark about some of the terrible things Richard Nixon was doing. By this point, it had become public knowledge that President Nixon had authorized bombing Cambodia. Innocent civilians were being killed in Southeast Asia at his order. The war in Vietnam was getting more violent, not less violent, but people, at least patriotic Christian people, were willing to look past these offenses because this was just part of getting America back on track to where it belonged. And of course, we know where this ends up. Nixon was reelected in 72, and it wasn't long after that before the Watergate scandal became inescapable and he was forced to resign the presidency in shame. Years later, in 2010, an interview, Billy Graham, he reflected back on those years and mentioned his involvement in politics as one of his greatest regrets. In the last decade, some of Richard Nixon's secret recordings, which he kept uh, uh, of all of his meetings during that time period were released and the recordings captured he and Billy Graham, the president and Billy Graham, discussing Jewish people. Graham's statements, Billy Graham's statements, are really just outright anti-Semitic. And it was a minor scandal when these tapes became public knowledge. And they stand as one of the greatest stains on the career and reputation of this minister that had been otherwise above reproach throughout his long career, ministry, and, and life. When you listen to them, though, when you listen to the recordings, you can almost hear what's happening. And I would, I would put them here on the podcast, but it's, it's kind of like you've got to listen closely to understand what's being said. But you can see or you can hear Billy Graham letting down his guard. You can hear him being led into President Nixon's trust and confidence. And you can sense him being seduced by the power of the presidency in politics. And in a way, that's really what happened with this whole system of Christian America at the end of the 60s and the beginning of the 70s under Richard Nixon. They just wanted to get back to the good old days. They wanted to get back to where, well, to win, things were, were good for America as one nation under God. And they got seduced. They got seduced by the possibility of power. They got seduced by the possibility of being heard, being important, being back on top. And they got betrayed and they got disappointed. As Nixon left office in shame, one can only imagine what Billy Graham and other Christians were thinking and feeling in those days. What would happen to America now? This was their chance to restore the, the nation to God. Now what? Fortunately, for the cause of religious Americans, all of America was disillusioned and worn out by this point in time. And the stage was set for a new hope and a new possibility to bring the nation back as one nation under God. And that's what we'll look at in our next episode in this series as we turn to the first born-again president and the start of the moral majority. Thanks for listening to The End of History with J.B. Shreve. Check out more episodes at iTunes and wherever you download quality podcasts. Join us online at theendofhistory.net for articles and essays from the end of history. Follow JB on Twitter at JB underscore Shreve. The End of History is produced by Windmill Media.